Okay, so why don't you introduce yourself and uh, the newspaper that you work for? I'm uh, Julian Borger. I'm the U.S. Bureau Chief for The Guardian newspaper. Okay, and so when you look at the build-up to the, the war in Iraq, how would you uh, distinguish the coverage that you would see from the United Kingdom versus what you saw here in the United States? I think the coverage in the British press was far more uh, aggressive uh, than in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. coverage tended to be quite reverential towards the administration in a way that British press uh, wasn't. And I, that's a basic cultural difference in the newspaper worlds and the media worlds in the two countries. And that applied very much so to uh, the, the build-up to the Iraq war and the issue of evidence for WMD and evidence of links between Baghdad and Al-Qaeda. And uh, what do you attribute, why are, the, why are there differences between uh, the, the press in the United Kingdom versus here in the United States? I see them as cultural differences really. They're in Britain, the newspaper world, and maybe the public at large, is far more cynical about government. I think to a certain extent there's a way in which American reporters reflecting American population still believes in some way that that if information comes from the administration or from an administration agency then it has in inherent worth. It may not be true but there is reason to believe it is true. In a way that's turned on its head in Britain. There's a, there's a, a deep-seated distrust of what you're being told by the government, what you're being told by government agencies, and um, a much deeper-seated instinct to aggressively go out and find out I if it's true. And, you know, one, another difference I see between the United Kingdom and the United States is that they have more parties. They have more than a two-party system. Do you see that that adds to the debate a little bit more and adds more viewpoints? or? Hard to say because, in, in a way, in both countries, in the U.S. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be including my, my question. All right, so yeah. If you can incorporate the... Uh... Hard to say whether the political structure had much of an impact. I mean, in both countries, in Britain and the U.S., you had a principal opposition party that was broadly, broadly supportive of going to war, or at least putting a lot of pressure on, on uh, Saddam Hussein up to the point of war, uh, the Tories in Britain and Democrats here. Uh, so I don't, the political structure wasn't really a function. Uh, there, is, there is a another sort of cultural difference in, in the media or maybe a structural difference in the relationship, the power balance between the media and government. And that's completely different in Britain. In Britain, the power balance between the press, the national press and the government is very much more weighted uh, towards the national press than it is here. There's much more dependence among American correspondents for access than there is uh, in Britain. And the British newspapers, national newspapers, can take the risk of really launching an aggressive attack on the government, knowing that sooner or later the government has to come back and talk to them again, and that it's in the interest of the government to come back and talk to that newspaper again. In the U.S., among correspondents on different beats in the Pentagon or the, the White House or whatever agency, department, there's a fear of being frozen out. And I think that fear does inform a, it's at the, in the background. Uh, it has to play a role. Uh, and that fear is always uh, an inhibitive factor on, on the reporting of, of journalists who have assigned those particular beats. So during the, the build-up to the war in Iraq, at what point did you see that, uh, did you have some skepticism towards the case that was uh, being made uh, with weapons of mass destruction? I suppose I became most skeptical at the time of the uh, famous aluminum tubes. Uh, and we did a story uh, looking at the various claims made by the administration. I think it was at the time of the Cincinnati speech in uh, October 2002 and there had been a string of claims in that the aluminium tubes that were supposed to be used for centrifuges and the uh, the um, drone aircraft and so on and I began to talk to people on the 
on the fringes of uh, the intelligence world and also in the uh, Department of Energy uh, who said, well, we don't actually believe that these aluminum tubes are for centrifuges. Uh, we believe that they're probably for rockets and they're not the right specifications. And then that uh, all led to uh, questioning more of the of the elements of the charges and, the, and it turned out that the drone, uh, the, the, the threat of a drone aircraft distributing uh, biological germ warfare in, in, the, in the United States of America on American soil was also extremely far-fetched and it, it began to unravel and it became clear that behind these claims there was not all that much solid intelligence. Uh, I mean, it seemed to me at the time that it was likely that there were uh, remnants of weapons of mass destruction from 91, 92, because people I knew who seemed in who former weapons inspectors thought, on balance, there's probably something there. There are probably remnants there, but probably not very much. And they, at that time, blew, were growing alarmed at the kind of claims that would be made by the British and American governments. Um, so I think it was w almost a consensus among the professionals in the field, the former inspectors and the intelligence people, that while there could be something still there, that it wasn't a threat, that it wasn't an immediate threat. And there was never a sense from intelligence professionals, here at least, that there was solid evidence for a link between Baghdad and Al-Qaeda. That there was almost a unanimity on inside the professional world. Ideologically, it's another story, but in the professional world, that always seemed clear. Now, it seems like you know, you're know you a foreign journalist and you're doing reporting that you know outside of Knight Ritter, like almost no one else within the media establishment was really, you know, how was it that you were able to report on this and was it because you were the only one asking the questions or how, what do you attribute that to the, you know, getting these types of stories? It may, it may be because I didn't have much access to the inner corridors of power. I didn't get called in to Langley for briefings or the White House for briefings. I had to go elsewhere and uh, talk to more people on the fringes who had a completely different view and that pointed me into directions that maybe if you'd gone to the briefings and got official briefings from senior officials you wouldn't be pointed in that direction. Uh, and the, Euro the aluminium tubes is, is an example and uh, the people I talked to again on the, on, on the fringes but who, who kind of knew the debate going on pointed to, all, towards the fact that met people in the Department of Energy uh, uh, in particular, were unhappy about the claims being made about the uh, the aluminium tubes, and so through that I got onto some on the Department of Energy. Now, if I'd had the official briefings, I might not have been pointed that way. But in a way, it was a, a result of being outside the loop. And one thing that I noticed is that and sometimes things will break, and the stories will break overseas in the British press, but then they don't seem to come across the ocean into the American press. Can you? Speak to that a little bit of, of this particular issue. Is there kind of a uh, oversight of anything else that's going on outside of the own borders of America? Can you rephrase that one? Well, uh, when you, uh, there are some stories such as, you know, Catherine Gunn, for example, was on, on mid-March where there's stories or, you know, the, the, the dodgy dossier and, and in Britain and, and kind of speak to those stories that didn't really pick up a lot of steam here in the United States. And, just I, th I think professional pride has a role to play here. Uh, if a story breaks the broad, especially, especially in Britain, uh, and the, the American press haven't got there, the, the instinctive reaction is, well, are those Brits here? Who knows if it's true? Uh, and there's almost more of a tendency to ignore the story rather than, rather than even to check it out. Uh, and I found that again and again. If, you, if a story breaks in, in Britain, there's almost the uh, the automatic reaction is uh, is the British press, it's tabloid, it's sensational, and uh, which is justified in many many instances. Uh, the, the the tabloid press and some of the broadsheet press in Britain can be fairly wild, uh, and you know, a lot of unsubstantiated stories get out. But on top of that, 
instinctive reaction of, well, it must be sensational because it's in the British press, is a reluctance to, to check it out properly, or uh, an over-readiness to accept assurances from the institutions, the White House, whatever, that although there's nothing to this story, it's just a British story, ignore it. There's a lack of, almost a lack of hunger uh, when it comes to stories uh, that question the administration's position. Until that is, the administration was so weakened by the, the failure of w, any WMD to appear, there was a, almost a, a turning of tides sometime last year in 2003 when you suddenly saw a greater readiness to go over these stories. It was like a, uh, the herd changing direction. Uh, it, was, it was very visible. And uh, speak a little bit about how you see American objectivity. You know, and, and there's a standard here in the American press that, and, and talk about the differences in the British press on that, that point. The American press have, a, have very high standards, and, and a lot of the journalists are of a very high caliber, and they're extraordinarily conscientious. They're very good at what they do. Um, but there is an innate conservatism uh, in journalism here that for it to be sensible and serious journalism it must be mild, its conclusions must be mild. Uh, if you come to a, a, a really shocking, extraordinary conclusion it must be sensational therefore it can't be good journalism and I think there is a sort of conservatism and in the profession with the exceptions Knight Ridder, Cy Hirsch and New Yorker, but they really stood out. Uh, and the re rest of the crowd, there was a m much greater sense of caution and a sense that if you're a good journalist, the stuff you come out with must, uh, can't rock the boat too much. It must, it, it shouldn't be too far from the, the conventional wisdom. Can you, are you also talking about a pack journalism in a way? You can't go too far outside, or in another way, I guess, is if if the uh, if if they come to a conclusion, they have to have someone else say it. They can't say it. Yes, that's true. Uh, and in a way, maybe that that is a good thing. Uh, I'm sorry. What is? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a way, maybe it, you know, it is a good thing, and it is something that, in general, I admire about the American press that there is a distinction, a much firmer distinction between editorial and what you report, uh, and that y you shouldn't be putting your views overtly uh, in the piece. Now, it's a, in, a, in the end, a matter of style, because obviously in your selection of quotes and your ordering of the story, your views will come through anyway. But I, I find it a less jarring style if you let those views come from, from other people and you give an airing to, to other views, but um, it's this shying away from conclusions and shying away from strong conclusions that jar with the conventional wisdom that I think somehow shackles American journalism. And often you'll see in a, the, one of the great stylistic differences between British and American journalism is that in British journalism the main point, the sort of the big punch point will come in the first paragraph. American print journalism you may not find out till sixth or seventh and I think again that is a symptom of this sense of feeling that serious journalism isn't sensational therefore you don't want to put your most sensational point up front because it might look like you're being flashy or trying to cause a cause an uproar and therefore not a serious journalist. Okay and did you watch uh, much American uh, either cable or broadcast television news leading up to the war, and what is your, your uh, kind of evaluation of the, the, the television news in the United States and their performance leading up to the war in Iraq? Well, uh, in terms of broadcast uh, cable or, or, or network news, there was a collective uh, abandonment of, of, of journalistic uh, objectivity in the run-up to the war. It was a, uh, it was a collective act of jingoism uh, in the run-up to the war. Uh, no sense that uh, a, a question about what side the, the journalists were on and what side uh, their reporting would, would, would support. Uh, and so any sense of questioning either motives for the war or the way 
the war was being pursued with regard to fairness or collateral damage, damage to, and, and the killing of civilians, all that went by the wayside. Uh, now it was most true obviously on Fox TV, but it was also true on the, the more moderate networks. And, and on my film I'm looking at leading up to the war starting you know from August 02 to March 03. So you know I think some of those comments you're talking about were during the war, but built during the build up mm. to the war did you kind of get a sense of a of a drum beat or what were some of your you know evaluations of the leading up to the, the actual military intervention? Well, I found it striking how little questioning there was of the uh, of the motives and of the evidence uh, and the justifications for war uh, for in a media that is by its nature sensational and headline grabbing there was this same reluctance to actually go for the jugular and say well tonight we look at whether there is any justification for this war which in any other circumstance you might think would be a very attention grabbing headline but it was felt to be too dangerous. Uh, and again, here this is uh, an aspect in which September 11th has had a very powerful impact. There's a sense of, are you being unpatriotic? Are you letting down the victims of 9-11? Of and it carried through very much to the benefit of the administration to the pre-Iraq period. Okay. And uh, on, on issues of international law, you know, it seems like both the government and the mainstream media here doesn't really even give any sort of legitimacy towards international law. So can you speak towards how the United Kingdom or other countries in Europe view international law versus the United States? That's one difference in the, the there's one difference in the media coverage that the actions of the government with relation to international law are very much at the center of reporting, is certainly in Britain or also in Europe, and they're just not at the center. In, in the US and I, I think maybe this is a, a success of the American right to have pushed these sense the, these whole these questions of international legitimacy and international law to the side as a uh, uh, as a diversion as all part of a, the UN circus and not something that directly concerns uh, the, the US uh, and buying into this assumption that anything the US does as a good nation must therefore inherently be good. There, there was a, a buying into that notion and that quiet assumption that underlay a lot of the reporting. And how do other nations view the United States when we, when, uh, in regards to international law? Well, it is one of those cases where, where the actions reinforce a stereotype in the minds of Europeans that, that's already there. There is this, this tendency from the word go to see America as a bully because it is a much more successful, powerful country uh, in the world. And when you had a string of actions by the Bush administration when it first came in, uh, dumping Kyoto and the International Criminal Court, then there was a growing predispos uh, predisposition to see the U.S. in this bully role. And then it fulfilled that expectation, fulfilled that stereotype many times over. And now it's very much hardened in the in the minds of of Europeans and, and the rest of the world, that this is uh, a, a bully nation with which has little regard for the the views of other nations, except when they are particularly useful. And during the build up in the war in, in late January, there was a shift in the Bush administration to pursue a second resolution. Can you speak to why you know the, the influence of Blair on this particular decision and, and why that happened? There were two things that, that Tony Blair really wanted in return for his support for uh, going to war in Iraq. And one was some action on the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict, some sense of re-engagement by the Bush administration. And the, the other was to go through the, the UN route and to, to seek not just one, but, but ultimately a, a, a second resolution that would harden and, and strengthen the sense of international legitimacy behind uh, an invasion and Blair didn't get one of those. He didn't get any real engagement in the Israel-Palestinian conflict but he did get uh, a decision from George Bush overriding in a rare example uh, overriding Vice President Dick Cheney siding with with Powell and Blair and going the UN route and so it was primarily uh, a, a favor 
to Tony Blair, but also I think the administration realised that it was necessary if there was any hope of amassing a, a broader coalition. In the end, it, it didn't work out. And uh, speaking to uh, how the, uh, the media in the United States covered this issue of the second resolution, you know, it seemed like uh, they said it's a political issue in the United Kingdom, but that's where it stopped. And can, can you speak to how that, that whole development was covered within the mainstream press here? Well, I think there was a, a sense in which it was seen as all part of I'm the... I'm sorry, what was seen? Oh, yeah. I, I think there was a sense in which the haggling over second resolution was all seen as part of the, the politicking that goes on in the corridors of the, the UN. It was power plays by the, the French and Russians, primarily the French, and seen as uh, uh, a stage in which the French were trying to limit American power in the world, that it wasn't about Iraq, it wasn't about weapons of mass destruction, this was really about two nations, uh, one of the new world, one of the old world that had seen its power diminish over time and was making a desperate, brid, uh, desperate bid to reassert itself on the world stage. So it was very much seen in those political terms, uh, which diverted attention from what was at the heart of the, of the issue. Was there any evidence of WMD? Were the uh, inspectors uh, able to uncover WMD if given the time? Those took almost second place behind the focus on the, the politicking that went on. Okay. And uh, from your sense, I don't know, did you, if you read through the, uh, the Butler report and also the issues of, of Lord Goldsmith, the Attorney General, and do you feel that his original advice is, did he give private advice saying that the war would be illegal and then did he switch it at the end or what is your read on that? I don't know. I'm not the best person to do the Goldsmith, Goldsmith thing because I, I haven't looked at Butler on Goldsmith. So. Okay. That's fine. Um, and let me see the uh, what's the question? The uh, and from your sense, was this? Uh, did they have international legitimacy to to go to war without that resolution? Was this war legal? In other words, not certainly not. Uh, the war definitely wasn't legal in, in British eyes, and, and that's one of the the outcomes of the the Butler report is that there wasn't sufficient evidence to prove that Iraq had violated. Resolution 1441, uh, which for the British at least was the, the, the foundation for the war. So there, there are in Britain very profound questions of, of the international legitimacy of the war. And, and talk to, uh, it seems that uh, Tony Blair was receiving a lot more flack from the public and from the government from what happened after, where in the United States there's you know, virtual silence compared to what was going on in Britain. Can you speak to what was going on, you know, after the war and with Tony Blair? Why, why was everyone so upset? I think Tony Blair, Blair's, I think Tony Blair's problem was that there was a predisposition to be cynical about his reasons for going for war. There was already a sense that we're going for war on very shaky grounds indeed. And so once uh, the we weapons of mass destruction weren't found, then he was in a much more vulnerable position than, uh, than Bush, who has a core constituency who will support him no matter what. He can fall back on 40% of the vote, uh, even if it was proved that he made up all the, the reasons for going for war you know, on, a, on a scrap of paper you know, in, in the Oval Office. Uh, and there is that ideological support that he can, he can rely on that Tony Blair can't, because Tony Blair, in following George Bush into a war, turned against the traditions of his own party which are I inherently skeptical, suspicious of the US and of the projection of power abroad, particularly at the shoulder of the, of the US. And so he was really taking on his own party. And for that reason, he didn't have this ideological bedrock of support that he could depend on when things got tough. 
in, from your sense, why did the United States and the United Kingdom go to war in Iraq? What are the motivations from your reading of what happened? I think the causes of the war are fairly complex uh, and they're different in Britain than from the US. I think in the US you had a very strong ideological constituency that came on board with George Bush in 2001 that were determined to go to war for, in Iraq because they saw it as unfinished business from the first Gulf War and they'd been pushing them. Sorry, I'll start again. Okay. Do you need okay. to drink or anything? Or? Um, uh, no, it's all right. Um, I think the causes of the war are very different in the U.S. and in Britain. In the U.S., you had uh, an ideological constituency that came to power with George Bush in 2001 that was determined to take on Saddam Hussein and to topple Saddam Hussein. It was all about unfinished business from the first Gulf War, uh, this sense that he was a primary threat to the U.S. Uh, in the oil-producing Gulf region primarily, but uh, also ultimately to U.S. power, U.S. interests elsewhere. Um, and that came together after 9-11 with the, the views of George Bush and, and, uh, and Dick Cheney, the, the sense of, that they had been attacked once, they were responsible for having allowed that attack to happen and were determined to strike out not just at the uh, immediate foe but any uh, potential future foe and to strike back hard before they were struck again and there was this sense that we have to get them before they get us and uh, that coincided with a strong constituency within the administration that was saying and continually into George Bush's ear Iraq is the big problem and so when those two came together it produced an irresistible force to go into Iraq uh, and so September 11th really accelerated that 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 movement I don't think they would have gone into Iraq in the in the first at least in the first term if it hadn't been for 9-11. Uh, I may be wrong about that and uh, you'll, we'll never know, but I, I don't think the, the neocons and the, the Iraq revanchists would necessarily have had enough power inside the administration to take U.S. into the same scale of war as it did in 2003. And as a, the Washington bureau chief here, are you covering the White House, State Department, and Pentagon and everything on your own, or what, what beats are, your, are you covering um, here? We have five correspondents in the, in the U.S. Uh, we all pretty much all cover everything. The two correspondents here in uh, Washington tend to cover the government, particularly since 9-11, when the rest of the world is obviously riveted on the next decision being made by the Bush administration. And so it's become very much a question of just covering this administration from the point of view of military intelligence, foreign policy, that has become the, the, the focus, the focus for all Washington correspondents. Okay. So, why did... Well, yeah, why... Uh, for why, why do you think that the... Well, the, I did not answer half a question of, you know, right. why did they go to war, and I didn't ask the oh, right. answer. Why did, why yeah. do you think that the, what were the interests within the United Kingdom? Yeah. Why they, yeah. why, why did Tony Blair seem to be so dedicated to this, this policy? I think there are two elements in, in Tony Blair's thinking. First of all, he was a convert to the belief that Iraq had serious WMD from early on, from first coming to, to office. He got briefings that, that made his hair stand on end and it became a, a primary concern. Secondly, he made a strategic decision that it is in British interest to stick with the U.S. Uh, even when Britain doesn't agree in the direction the U.S. is going because that is Britain's power in the world to be this bridge between Europe and the U.S. He also argued that it was better 
that we go in with the US and have an influence than the US go in alone and be this rogue superpower uh, on whom no one has an influence. So there was that consideration as well. It's all a, this obsession in Britain about punching above our weight in the world and being more influential than we ought to be as a small uh, medium power island. Okay. And uh, do you see that the, the nature of the competition within the, the newspapers in uh, the United Kingdom is more rigorous and that gives more, you know, more aggressive reporting versus the reduced ownership here in the United States? I think all the local monopolies enjoyed by the main American papers has got to have a, a dampening effect on, on the aggressiveness of the, uh, the reporting. But uh, I think you can overdo that. I mean, they are all competing against each other. The LA Times is competing with the New York Times, competing with the Washington Post when it comes to national stories. I think that applies more to local stories or national stories. The, the competition is there. but. Given that competition, they're all worried about being frozen out by the administration. No correspondent wants to be frozen out, so he's not being briefed while his colleagues from the New York Times and the Washington Post, say, are getting the briefings and he's left that, locked outside the door. I think that is the, the chilling fear that, uh, that is in the spines of uh, a lot of American journalists of being locked out. And I think that's a very powerful tool the administration can use and has used. Okay. And there seems to be a difference between the, uh, the debates within the Parliament in the United Kingdom versus the debates here in Congress. They're a lot more subdued here and a lot more lively. Can you talk to, you know, the, the cultural differences within Britain for engaging in debate and, and the nature here in the United States of public relations? Uh, again, I think this is a question of, this is a question of political institutions. In America, the head of state and the head of government is one person, it's the president. In Britain, the head of government is a civilian. He's not the head of state. He doesn't embody the nation. He's just another politician. And so he's answerable every week before parliament has to go to question time and be grilled. And that is a difference uh, with America where it is beneath the dignity of the, the head of state, the president, to be grilled in such an undignified manner in, in Congress. So he doesn't have to face that. And without that, without that collision of executive and legislative, you don't have the, the sparks don't fly. Uh, it's a relatively dull matter in, the, in Congress because there are no real, they're not the same stakes. The president isn't there answering questions, isn't there confronting angry senators or congressmen. And so that's a very fundamental difference in the way the, the two uh, political systems are ordered. And that has another effect as well. The president in the United States embodies the nation in a way the prime minister in Britain doesn't. The prime minister is just doing a job. When Americans choose a president, they're choosing someone who they want to embody them. And there is a reluctance for that reason to believe that the president is involved in cheap political games when it comes to foreign policy and, and sending the military abroad. There is a, the, a longing to believe that the president is acting on the noblest of intentions and uh, embodying America abroad. And so there is a reluctance to question the president in the same way that the, uh, that the prime minister is constantly uh, exposed to doubt and cynicism in, in Britain. And in, in leading up to the war, there was, uh, you mentioned that, you know, Tony Blair had some influence to going to the UN at all. And from the American press, it, it only seems like the, the sole factor was Colin Powell. You know, to, from your sense, what influence did, did Tony Blair have? on Bush to go to the UN in the first place? In a way, it's impossible to tell. Colin, the, it's impossible to tell who had the most influence. There's Colin Powell and Tony Blair's 
pressures co coincided, converged, and the end result w was that that uh, the administration took the UN route. It's impossible to take those apart and say if it hadn't been for Blair, would Powell alone have prevailed? I think it's pretty clear that without Powell in the administration, Blair would not have prevailed. But Blair did have significant influence because without Britain going in on an, the, the side of the administration, on the side of the US into this war, it would have looked very much more like a unilateral action without world support. There is something iconic, totemic, about having British troops in there uh, for the American people. American people feel, well, if Britain's with us, at least some of the world is with us. Without the, the old ally being by the side of uh, American troops, it would have been a much harder sell for this administration. And the consequences would have been much worse for the Bush administration if it had gone in without British support. Yes. Um, can you talk to what exactly uh, Tony Blair promised uh, the Parliament? Um, did he promise for a second resolution? Or what, talk about, you know, when they say it was a political decision uh, in the United Kingdom, just kind of elaborate on what exactly, you know, Tony had said to the Parliament. Uh, I, c I can't, you know, remember, you know, what was said at what cabinet meeting and so on. And, and so I'm shakier on that because, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been my my patch on what the the deal was with cabinet and, and parliament i i don't have those you know the the memory of the uh, sequence of events and do you have mind. any uh sense of why claire short or robin cook why they you know, can you talk about uh, them and why they end up resigning uh robin cook uh, resigned on, on principle he didn't think that the war was legal, he didn't think there was justification for going to war, and so he resigned out ahead of the war. Claire Short was persuaded to, to stay on uh, on the grounds that uh, once the the war took place that there would be a very serious rebuilding, UN rebuilding effort. And it was only when it was clear that actually that wasn't going to happen, that the US was very much running the post-war scenario as well. Uh, that she was finally, uh, she finally decided to resign. By the time she she had, of course, she'd lost a lot of her credibility. She hadn't resigned ahead of the war. She looked like she'd prevaricated and uh, and vacillated, and so that it had much less of an effect uh, than than Robin Cook's departure. Okay, and now what is the sense of uh, what? people within the United Kingdom, how do they view the United States now after this, this intervention? There's a great deal of distrust uh, of the U.S. now. Uh, I think there's a lot of focus on this election because uh, there is a sense in Britain that there was something very dodgy about the 2000 elections and it may be that President Bush and this administration has gone way off to the, the right and doesn't represent the country. Now, what happens in November will be very important in, in terms of how Britain and the rest of Europe and the rest of the world views America, because will they see the Bush administration as embodying the American people? Uh, and if, of course, he wins and gets a, a mandate, then it'll be seen, well, this is really the, the, the will of the American people, uh, the preemptive foreign policy and all that. And this is what Americans want. There is a sense in which the jury is out about what a, a, the role and the views of the American people are in all this because of the nature of the 2000 election. Okay. And uh, let's see. The... Oh, the, the, the BBC. Can you talk about kind of the structural differences between the BBC versus the uh, new system here? Um, in other words, the, the government subsidies and the, how that, from your perspective, influences their coverage or, or makes it better or worse? Well, the BBC opposite operates on a charter, uh, and that insulates them to a great degree from direct government influence. They're not uh, dependent on a year-to-year -year grant, and so that gives this sense of uh, much greater... Sorry, I'll start again. 
Well, the, the BBC operates on a charter which gives them a much greater sense of independence. They're not uh, dependent on getting subsidies hand to mouth each year, each month. Uh, and so that gives them a certain distance from the, the government and they are much more likely to go after uh, the government, to be critical uh, of the government than um, uh, their equivalents here who don't have that, that same sense of, uh, of independence. And now we see, uh, you know, with the, what is your reading on the Andrew Gilligan case? Was that really a, a case of uh, malfeasance or, or was there actually legitimate concerns about this 45 minute weapons claim that's uh, since come out, but not really come out here in the American press as much? I think that the, the, the BBC and Andrew Gilligan were very unfortunate. They got the big story right that there was pressure to sex up the, the dossier. Unfortunately, the, the methods and the, some of the details were, were wrong and so they were very vulnerable to attack. BBC made a big mistake not fessing up to those uh, mistakes very early on said, yeah, okay, these were some mistakes, but broadly speaking, we, we stick with the story and we have a lot of evidence to, to prove it, that this uh, evidence is being hyped up. Uh, and that turning it into a show of strength between, or a battle of strength between the BBC and the government uh, was a mistake because the BBC was vulnerable on, on, on the details. And the big picture, it was actually turned out to be right. And, and so from your sense, I think a, a lot of the American press is trying to pin all the blame on the Central Intelligence Agency. What is your your take? Do you see that it, it was just the CIA bad intelligence, or, or does that make sense? Obviously, it wasn't just the CIA. I, I don't necessarily believe that that's the way the American press is, is portraying it. I think there is an awareness in the reporting that you've seen on the American press that there was a very deliberate avoidance of dealing with the administration and it was being whole consideration of the administration's role was put off until this phase two sometime in the in the future so there is an awareness that not all the story has been told uh, and it's quite clear that there was an environment in which CIA analysts believed that certain sorts of reports would be well received and would be good for their career and certain other reports would be sent back, questioned and wouldn't be good for their career. And uh, there has been a reluctance by the investigations on both sides of the, of the Atlantic to look into the role of that mechanism because it is a political mechanism. No one asked anyone specifically to lie as far as anyone knows. It was just an atmosphere and an environment but it was nevertheless very real. And do you also, did you do some, you did some reporting on Office of Special Plans, mm -hmm. right? And, and what did you see uh, was the influence of this kind of like alternative intelligence unit? Now the role of the Office of Special Plans and the, before that, the, the intelligence cell within Doug Fyatt's office came up early on. It came up in 2002 because CIA uh, officials were getting really annoyed that there was this parallel route for intelligence to pass through to get to the White House. There was a great deal of annoyance and there was a great deal of frustration that the analysts were coming under pressure. And there was such a, a build-up of annoyance that it was, was coming out. Uh, people were, were talking about it and uh, again the people on the fringes of the uh, of the uh, intelligence world, the former officials who were still in touch with their colleagues were raising the alarm about this and all this was out there in 2002 uh, and very much uh, real on the radar and that is a remarkable thing that there was so little reporting of it in in the US press because it was definitely out there Knight Ritter and New Yorker again the exceptions to the rule and do you uh, do you see editorially the, the New York Times did you see a pattern that they were playing these sensational claims on the front page and then burying them and then, you know, as, as it was even running up to the war, you know, in hindsight we can see that, but what was your perspective for during the build-up when you're reading the New York Times or Washington Post? I think the patterns become clear afterwards. I mean, it would be very easy to say, oh yes, I saw a pattern all the way along 
and it was uh, information was being manipulated. But it, it just shows that how uh, insidious it is that uh, these these uh, certain reports about on the outside, others on the inside, and that when you look back on it uh, by you know, looking in databases, it looks like they've been given almost equal uh, weight. But in fact. You know, some were being projected and some were being buried, and it was a, a had a very insidious effect on on public opinion and on a, on the sort of conventional wisdom inside the Beltway. And uh, I guess one question I've been asking a lot of people is: from this point on, do you have a vision of what it's going to take for uh, for world peace? Do you have a vision of of where we're at now and what needs to happen? Um, from both within this government and all governments around the world to kind of get to where it's, it's a little bit more rational with our, our relations with each other. Uh, I suppose what it takes is an awareness of interconnectedness on part of populations, uh, a sense that the modern world, all countries are interconnected, interdependent, and cannot act unilaterally without severe repercussions down the road. Uh, and I think it is uh, dangerous that there is a significant part of the American population that believes that America will, can do what it likes, uh, and because they inherently see America as a good country and they see themselves as good people, uh, that ultimately the rest of the world will fall into line and recognize that. And I think that's a, a dangerous thing. And I think only when an awareness grows up that, that there are repercussions for acting unilaterally and acting solely in short-term national interests, then you can begin to see a political shift. And did you see that there was a, a, you know, a clear lack of questioning of this preemptive policy during this critical time period. And you know, what was there a lot more questioning in, in the British press versus what you saw here in the United States press? Yeah, there was very much more questioning in the British press. There was an inherent. I'm sorry, of what? Oh yeah, there was much more questioning about the idea of a preemptive military and foreign policy in the British press and the American press and among the British people and the American people, of course, we're a small power, America is a great superpower. And of course, America had been through 9-11 and, and that had an enormous difference, that had an enormous impact on the, the mindsets of the population, the elites, the media, this sense of this country was suddenly vulnerable in a way that other countries had always been vulnerable. Uh, but that sense of American exceptionalism and invulnerability had been punctured and it had a great impact on the way people looked at the world and there was a great sense of consensus, we must go after them first and get them first and a growing impatience with the limits on action, the international limits on action, the, the need for consensus with other countries. Uh, and it was a, a terrible waste because there was a great upswell of support for the for, uh, the U.S. and U.S. foreign policy in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, that was there and offers of help and offers of international cooperation to deal with terrorism and the, the traffic in WMD and it was wasted over Iraq. Uh, 